Take your Bibles, turn to Revelation 2, um, and then open up to the book of Proverbs. When you get to Revelation 2, put your little bookmark there. Go to Proverbs, put your little bookmark there, because we're going to go to Proverbs 1, Proverbs 2, Proverbs 4, Proverbs 5. We're going <clears> to <throat> we're gonna learn how to defeat Jezebel. Yeah, you say amen now, John. But Elijah ran off licking his wounds. Uh, after he defeated the prophets of Jezebel, he walked off and ran, hid in a cave for 40 days. He said, it is enough. Now take away my life. So, yeah, she's hard to deal with sometimes. Revelation chapter 2, uh, this morning... Uh, you pray for me. I'm going to start the series on prayer. Um, it's actually part of Ephesians 6 and the spiritual warfare that we do and taking on the whole armor of God. And when you think about it, the, the one act that is common in practically every religion in the world is prayer. Now, I'm not saying that every religious prayer is right. I'm not saying that. But prayer itself is the quintessential religious act, which is what stirred up the liberals in 1963 because before 1963, it was, it was left up to individual schools. <clears throat> some schools did it, some schools didn't. But in public school systems across America, they started the day out with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I remember growing up in the early 70s, going to school in the early 70s, we listened to a patriotic song every day. Uh, played over the intercom, and then we set our pledge to the American flag. We were taught citizenship. Uh, but this comes before my lifetime. Before 1963, schools opened up with Christian prayer. Christian prayer. And uh, that's how it was done. And in 1963, the liberals and the liberal Earl Warren Supreme Court declared that, and they were right, that prayer is a quintessential religious act. There is no such thing as prayer to a non-deity, in my opinion. Now, I can ask another person here for help or something, but a prayer is to a deity. Now, I don't know with their decision, but I'll tell you this, I would not want to bring prayer back into public schools today. I would not want that. What do you have now? You have every other God in this country now, and your children would be forced to conform to other people's religion. In fact, in some cases, they are anyway. They would be forced to conform to other people's gods, and God told us specifically, don't do that. So if we fought for, to get prayer back in school, and then we sent our kids to school, and they said, okay, well, today we're going to pray to Allah, we would say, we're pulling our kids out. We're not praying to Allah. You wanted prayer back in. We have to pray to, we have to do it to, if we pray to one God, we have to do it to all of them. So we're in a case now to where the government is not in charge of Christianity anymore. Christ is. That's where it should be. Amen? Amen. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, um, <clears throat> very quickly, uh, verse 20, I, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Um, we've looked at Jezebel, we've looked at what she is, she despises authority, she is a harlot, she is a practitioner, practitioner of witchcraft, um, 
I was asked this question this morning, and I, I, will, I will tell you what I was asked, and I will give you my answer. According to the Bible, what power does our tongue have? Let me just, let me get specific. According to James, according to the book of James, what power does our tongue have? Do what? We put bits in horses' mouth. I, God woke me up at 6 o'clock this morning, had me read the book of James. We put a small bit in a horse's mouth, and we steer that entire horse's body with that one small bit. That's how you do it. You don't pull on your ears. You use the bit. They put a, a, a rudder on a ship. Massive aircraft carrier. It's turned with a rudder. Smallest part of the ship. And he said, your tongue is a small part of your body. But it actually does more. It can either do more good or more harm than anything. And James said that it sets the world on fire and that fire comes from hell itself. So when people talk about, I'm going to set the world on fire Got to be careful where that fire comes from. That fire could come from hell. You could be doing more harm. Here's the question. Somebody asked me. Somebody knows somebody that was sick. They put it on Facebook. Somebody said, I speak healing over them in Jesus. And now they're healed. Because I spoke healing over them. Here's what they've been taught. They've been taught this by Joel Osteen. They've been taught this by Joyce Myers. I've read their material, I know what they say and I know what they think. I know what their doctrine is. It is the, it's called the law of attraction. In witchcraft, there is, a, there is a practice called the law of attraction. I have books on witchcraft you had never seen before. And I've got one called The Complete Idiot's Guide to Wicca and Witchcraft. And it's got a whole section in there dealing with the law of attraction. And what it says is that the universe will respond to your commands. All you have to do is say the right words with a positive confession and the universe will grant you your wishes. Okay? That, that I could tell you, I could stand here for hours and tell you where that is showing up at. But it's showing up in churches now. Because people have been told that if they make positive confessions that positive things, God will release positive things to them. So all they have to do is say, I speak healing over you. And you're healed. Did it work? No. Okay. That's witchcraft. We were talking about the show Bewitched last Sunday morning. You remember Aunt Clara? The bumbling witch. She was always getting the spells wrong. She was always saying the wrong things. And all of a sudden, a donkey would show up in the living room of their house. Or something like that. Or they'd end up, you know, 300 years ago or whatever. And then she'd have to try to undo the spell by speaking the right words. That's what's being taught to people who call themselves Christians. God says it's witchcraft. If you want healing, can you... Can you give it to yourself? No. If you wanted to add a cubit to your stature, could you do it just by thinking about it? That's what Jesus said. He said, no. So how can your tongue, which is wicked, declare things that are right? Let God be true and every man a liar. You want healing, you go to the one who can heal, which is Jesus Christ. And this morning, is, and it's, if, I were to, if I were to teach and preach everything that the Bible says on prayer, how long, would I, how long would it take? You guys would be praying for me to stop. Okay? But I'm telling you, to those of you who are children of God, God will never tell you no. He will either give you what you ask for, or he will give you something better than what you ask for. That's what I'm telling you. And anyway, let's move on. Revelation, uh, Proverbs chapter 2. 
told you to turn there. Let's get in the Word. This is how you defeat Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel, which is the spirit of Babylon the Great. There are two, there are two spirits in the Bible. You see them clearly. You see the Holy Spirit. You see the manifestations of the, of the Holy Spirit. You see the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You see what the Holy Spirit does. You see what you find out, you read the Bible, what the Holy Spirit won't do. And don't give me this nonsense. Well, not everything that God does is in the Bible. That's nonsense. All scripture is given by inspiration of God's profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and truly furnished unto all good works. If God's going to do it, the Holy Ghost is going to do it through the word of God. Period. Then you have the spirit of Babylon, which always operates outside of the boundaries of the word of God. The written word of God. She will always act outside of those boundaries. She hates the Bible. So how do you defeat her? Proverbs chapter 2, verse 16. In fact, let's back up just a little bit, get the context of it. That's why I want you in the, in the Bible instead of looking on the screen all the time, because I may back up and punt a little bit. Uh, if you look at verse 1 of chapter 2, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. Receive my words. Hide thy commandments. So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Then he says um, in verse 10, When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. There's a time in our lives, all of us, when what we wanted to do was wrong. And we knew it was wrong. And that's what we wanted to do. But then there comes a time when we don't want to do wrong anymore. We want to do right. And we can't live that life anymore. And so we come to God, we come to God's word to learn how to live the right life. Amen? And that's what he's saying here. Uh, verse 12, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things. Froward, remember what that means. It's the opposite of two word. It'll take you away from the word of God and heaven. Verse 13, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways, what, how's a snake move? Whose ways are crooked. Right? How many politicians are like this? Who rejoice to do evil, delight in the frowardness whose ways are crooked, and they forward in their paths. Verse 16, now here's where it is. To deliver thee from the strange woman. Strange woman. That means, listen to this, men. She doesn't belong in your life. She's not your wife. She doesn't belong there. She's a stranger. She has no business in your business. Amen? She has no business telling us in our church what to believe, what not to believe. And that's what Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, in that church of Thyatira was doing. She was... I got to tell this story. Caleb worked late last night. He worked for a catering company. And there's a strange woman there, right? And she, is, she has got it. She is 60 years old. She lives by herself. Go figure. And I think she got fired last night. She always jumps in, tries to be the boss of everything that she's involved in. And she mouthed off to the customer. And the customer said, you got no right to do that. I think what she said was, get it yourself. A waitress doesn't tell you, get it yourself. So anyway, that's what I'm talking about. Nobody, this, this Jezebel prophetess, this woman, came into that church to be the boss in that church. And she has no place there. She has no right there. She has no business there. And Jesus said, I'm going to give her a space to repent. But if she doesn't, 
She's in trouble. And that's who the strange one, and Proverbs. God taught me this several years ago. Mike, read the book of Proverbs. So I did. I said, okay, that's good. God said, read it again. So I read it again. God said, read it again. And then I'm picking up. There's two women in the book of Proverbs. There's the wise woman who represents the church. She represents Jerusalem above heaven. Then there's the strange woman. She represents hell, the spirit of Babylon. And it says, verse 17, which forsaketh the guide of her youth. In other words, she was raised right, but quickly walked away from the way that she was raised. She forsook the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. See, the covenant that we are under is the covenant of grace through faith. And when you walk away from a faith-based salvation to a works-based salvation, you have followed the strange woman. Because we're not under the law anymore. We, if we were, we would all be doomed. We're under grace through faith. We believe simply what God said. We believe what God said about the flood. We believe what God said about the creation. We believe what God said about Jesus. We believe what the Bible says about the book of Revelation and what's going to happen in the future and the new heaven and new earth. We believe what God says about all of those things. It's that simple. But she forgot those things. She forgot faith. And she's all about do what I tell you to do and, you, and you'll have salvation. Um, in the case of Thyatira... She was teaching and seducing the people in that church to eat things strangled and to commit fornication. She was telling them, if you do these things, God will enrich your life. And it's witchcraft. Verse 18, for her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. What are the paths of life? You're holding them in your hand, right? You got it in your lap right now. The paths of life are the word of God. And you cannot, Jesus said you cannot serve two masters and you cannot have two spirits in you. In fact, that, that's an interesting term. Two spirit. Do you know what the Native American people in the First Nations, the Indians in Canada and America, do you know what they called homosexuals? They had them. They called them two-spirited. And they didn't shun them. They honored them. They, they said that they have two spirits in them. And the great spirit has chosen them and given them favor to give them two spirits. Okay? But can you serve two spirits? Can you, serve two, can you have two heads? Okay? Can you have two mouths? You're bad enough with one of them. These things here, if you follow her, you, you cannot and you will not follow the word of God. You'll either walk away from the word of God to follow her, or you're going to leave her to follow the word of God. Which one does you better? Which one, which one gives you more peace at night? And early in the morning, when you have no peace. Okay? Uh, Proverbs 5, turn there. Let's start at verse 1. Here again, this is, this is how we defeat her. My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion. Who remembers a day when you were discreet about things? You didn't burp at the table. And I'm not, there's things I won't even mention. That we don't teach our children anymore. They don't teach it to them in school anymore. See, I, if you look at my re report cards, 
from elementary school. Don't laugh, Mom. I'm not going to tell my grades. But we used to get graded on citizenship. Who remembers that? Citizenship. That's not a school thing. Yes, it is. Schools and the parents thought it wise to teach children to be good citizens. To be responsible so that the courts don't have to take care of every problem in your life. See how it works? You're either going to follow God or you're, gonna, or you're going to follow or the government is going to rule over you. And I mean rule over you. Tell you what you can and cannot do. And this is where we are right now. But anyway, that thou mayest regard discretion and that, the lips, that thy lips may keep knowledge. Four, verse three, for the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb. How does a honeycomb drop? Slow. And smoother than oil. You see, that woman wants something. She wants something. She wants money or she wants jewelry or she wants dominance or she wants whatever. But she wants something. And women learn at a young age now how to get what they want. They speak with smooth words. Harlots don't tell you you're fat and ugly and I won't have anything to do with you. Because what they want more than anything is your money. They don't care about you. They don't care about how you look. They don't care about your personality. They don't care about what kind of guy you are. They care nothing about you. They just want your money. And is the world right in judging churches nowadays? That same way. In many cases, yes. Because that church just wants their money. You do what we tell you to do. We'll speak flattering words to you. We'll tell you how good you really are. We'll tell you that everybody's going to heaven. I had the responsibility last Saturday of, I mentioned it, of preaching uh, a message, a funeral message of a man that I did not know. And I was told two different things. I was told he was lost and I was told by somebody, oh, he made things right with God several years ago. I don't know. I don't know where he is. And if I don't know where he is, don't ask me to tell everybody he's in heaven now. He's in a better place. I can't, and I told everybody that at that funeral. And I had one of the funeral director's helpers come up to me after the message and he said, thank you for saying that. Because that guy hears preachers in that funeral home tell everybody that they're all going to heaven. Oh, they're in a better place now. They're at peace. They're in heaven with... You know, Uncle Sam and Aunt Joe, and they're all happy and everything's fine now. But they're probably in hell. And a preacher won't tell them that. He won't say it. And so that's a strange woman. Remember, these women represent churches. And there are churches who will speak soft words to you. And they'll tell you how good you are and tell you everything's okay between you and God all the time. But it's not. God is angry at the sinners and the wicked every day. Is he not? Isn't that what the Bible says? So that's her. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Which is why I say this is how to defeat her. Because our Bible is what, Gary? Sharper than any two-edged sword. These words will defeat her and her words every single time. Amen? Uh, if, if, if something ever comes up between you and somebody about doctrine, don't give them your reasoning. Give them Scripture. And if they won't regard Scripture, 
There's nothing you're going to say that's going to change your mind. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. This is why I said the, the two spirits in the Bible, one of them is from heaven, the other one's from hell itself. And her tongue is what James was talking about. Her, uh, um, her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell, lest thou shouldest ponder the path, path of life. Remember what that is, that's the Bible. She doesn't want you memorizing Bible verses. She doesn't want you knowing the Word of God and sitting and meditating about the Word of God. So what did she invent 60, 70 years ago that has replaced family Bible time in the homes? I grew up watching TV. Okay? That's the generation I'm from. Didn't know no better. Um, but that's her. That's her spirit. Anything to pull you away from the, from the words that are in this book, to keep you from pondering the path of life, to keep you from thinking about where you're going to end up when you die. The path of life has an end to it, does it not? That road has an end, and it's either going to end in hellfire or it's going to end in heaven. She doesn't want you pondering that. So she's going to fill your life with everything in the world that you desire, everything that you want, everything that you want to be, every ideal that you have. When I, when, I was, when I was young, I had my mind on me, only on me. It was about what I wanted, what I wanted to do, what I was going to attain to, what I was going to get successful at, what this and that and the other. And God drove that, man... I realized I was following after the wrong spirit. And so her steps take, or lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. La donna mobile. You ever heard that song? You know what it means? La donna mobile. It, La donna means the woman. Mobile is where we get the word mobile. Movable. The song says, a woman is fickle. Right? And that's what the Bible says. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. She's always changing everything. I'm not going to say that. I've read conspiracy theories for most of my life. And I found out by reading the Bible that a lot of the things that I thought were wrong, flat out, dead wrong. Okay? And the theories keep changing every three or four years. And then people come up with dates for the rapture. And when those dates don't happen, what do they have to do? Change the dates. Never apologize. Just keep changing the dates. Um, but her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. So they have the 27th edition of the Greek New Testament out. They're working on the 28th edition. And the guy who is working on that edition of the United Bible Society said that every time we make a change to the Greek New Testament, we're trying to get to the original, but actually we keep changing it every time we send out a new edition. And he said that's the paradox of it. We're trying to get to the earliest version of the Bible that we can get to, but we keep changing it every time we add or move words or take words out or add words to it. So when they come out with the 28th Greek New Testament, what would they have to do with all the Bibles that are out on the market? The NIV, the New American Standard, the New Revised... What would they have to do with those Bibles? They'll have to retranslate them based upon the new Greek text that's out. And the NIV that you have that is 20 years old will be out of date and the words will be different. In 10 years' time, the NIV that you have now, if you have one, will be different. There's PowerPoints that I have that go back to 2003, when I first started doing PowerPoints, 
of Bible verses in the NIV. And when I went looking in the current NIV for those same Bible verses, I found out that they changed them. And my PowerPoints are no longer valid. They're out of date unless I want to show you how they've changed the Bible in the last 20 years. Just in the last 20 years, the NIV. How many times they've changed it over and over and over again. And that's what I mean. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Our forefathers have been memorizing verses out of the King James for over 400 years. Okay? The guy that sent me the Bible from 1730, this guy, I think it's from 1730, this guy wrote in there his name and the date that he got saved by reading that Bible. And it was the same Bible you got in your lap. We're going to meet that guy in heaven. That was over 300 years ago. We're going to meet that guy in heaven one of these days. Somebody say amen. Okay? That is awesome. And he knows the same verses that we know. Because we haven't changed our Bible. Amen. That's how you overcome her. Uh, verse 7. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. That means don't go to her church. It means don't go to her website. It means unfriend her on Facebook and block her. I blocked a guy this week. My phone kept going off every minute. And I couldn't figure out what was, what was making the sound. And it was Facebook Messenger. And it was a guy who believed in multiple Gospels. He was a hyper-dispensationalist. And he believed, and he said, there are, there are at least six different Gospels in the Bible. And I went, uh-uh, I blocked him. I'm not going to get into it with him, because I know I'm not going to win the argument with him. He's got his mind, and he, what he was doing, he was bombing me every minute with websites to go to, and things that he wanted to, and I just cut it off and blocked him. Because I'm not going for that garbage. Her ways are movable. That's crazy. I'm not doing it. That's how you defeat her. Come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. How much money would you have if you hadn't spent it all on sin? Amen? And thy labors be in the house of a stranger, and, and thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Because that's what she does. She turns beautiful young ladies, 20 years old, into what looks like a 90-year-old hag because of methamphetamine use. Or because she's been with so many guys who've beat on her and abused her and used her and destroyed her. She has no reason to live whatsoever. That's her. That's how the devil, that's how sin leaves you. That's how drugs leave you. That's how, alco that's how alcohol leaves you. Amen. Smart girl. That's how pornography leaves you. That's how adultery leaves you that's how power leaves you that's how money uh the love of money leaves you your sin will destroy your body it'll kill you early age i had an uncle died of cirrhosis of the liver what age 34 years old cirrhosis of the liver from drinking just from alcohol. This Bible's right. Verse 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern. We all know what that means. Do I have to explain it? And running waters out of thine own well. Now, let me, let me, let me apply this on a religious scale. How many books do you need to learn Christianity. One. One. So, 
And I may not be speaking to anybody here. I'm definitely speaking to a thousand people on the other end of that camera who are watching us because we went out on the internet. And the reason we went out on the internet is I knew what was out there. I knew the lies that were being told. And it's the same lies we started streaming in 2011, 10 years later. It's the same lies. They're just repackaged. And they're still lies. And you're still following them. You're still going after them. You still spend more time looking at the internet to see what you think could happen than you are in your Bible, which will never lie to you. And you know more about politics and finance and world banks and Jewish conspiracies and vaccines and big pharma and everything else. You know more about that than you know what's in this book. Shame on you. And shame on me. Because I did it. And God brought me out. Put me in this book where I belong. What, it, what this is saying is, drink waters out of thine own cistern, running waters out. This is your well right here. This is, this is it. This is what God gave you to learn the truth. What did our forefathers have before the internet? What did my grandma read? She sat on Facebook all day? Did Mima sit on Facebook all day? Can you imagine that? She didn't know how to run the tape player. She had a little cassette that the, the church sent her because she couldn't... She missed a Sunday and the church sent her a cassette and... I showed up at her house and she said, Mike, show me how to do this. And I put it in the cassette player and I hit play. She said, how'd you know do that? I said, Meemaw, I've had a cassette player all my life. Can you imagine my grandmother on Facebook? No, she read her Bible. And our forefathers knew way more about what was coming in their lifetime than most of us know. And we have better tools now to search this Bible than we've ever had before. And we're dumber about it than all of our forefathers put together. Let thy fountains dispersed, be dispersed abroad in rivers of waters in the streets. Why, why do you people online come here? Is it because I'm teaching you about conspiracy theories? Have you ever heard me talk about conspiracy theories during a Sunday school lesson or a Sunday morning sermon? I keep it different. Thanks. I keep it different because this is a different ministry. But you're here today to hear me teach out of this book. And that's what that means. Verse 16, let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. In other words, what we're doing inside this church is spilling out all over the world. And that's what we want. Amen? Let, thy, let them be only thine, let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. Stick with your wife. And wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman? And I'll say it like this. How would you feel if I went and started pastoring another church along with this one? Put me out. That's like a guy trying to have two wives or a wife and a mistress. Okay? You wouldn't have it that way, would you? And, I, and I'm going to be honest with you, I can get pretty jealous too. Okay? I, want you to, I don't want you to stick with me, I want you to stick with the Bible. Um, verse 21, For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Men, ladies... 
Think about your life. Think about where you are. Think about what's going on. Think about how Jezebel's trying to destroy you. And use the word of God. Use the tool, the sword that you have against her. Because your sword is sharper than hers. Use it. Use it every time. Okay? Father, bless your word. Thank you for it. These are good words. We need them. I need them. Father, you woke me up at 6 o'clock this morning. And I was going to read something else. And you said, no, the word first. Seek you out the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. And Father, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. Father, bless your word. Bless it in the hearts of these people, Father, so that they hunger for it. They crave it. So they get to the point, God, they don't want anything else floating around in their brain. They don't want anything else in their mind or in their heart except your word and your spirit. Give that to us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.